Hello and welcome to Eat Your Backyard, my YouTube channel where I try to help you to create your own fruit forest. This is a Saturday afternoon live stream, waiting for people to jump on. We're going to talk about growing red things today, red vegetables. I've got two types of micro greens that I'm going to be growing in pots, and then in later videos I'm going to be growing them as well in a more full-size version in larger pots along with some other really cool superfood type vegetables that you could grow in your yard. Okay, so today we've got red kale and dark red beets and I'm going to I'm going to also talk about some health benefits of both as described by Healthline. I'll get two articles that I'm going to cover here and then be looking forward to get your comments in the chat window as we proceed. All right, check this out. live stream Saturday afternoon hangout we won't make the pace too fast how's everybody doing I can tell you in Florida it is rather rainy we've had a consistent onshore flow of rain we've had a consistent onshore flow of wind for the last week or so which has battered everything Today I actually had to put up the canopy to be able to do this live stream. <laughs> You're going to grow a coconut tree in Palm Springs, California, George Sarkis. I think that's a great idea, and I think Palm Springs could not be a better place to grow it, although it's fairly arid, isn't it, in Palm Springs, I would imagine, which I wonder what, that, what effect that has on coconut tree growth. Well, so growing vegetables is a topic that I don't actually cover a lot on this channel just because growing vegetables in Florida can be so problematic, uh, especially in the summertime where the temperatures are scorching hot way into the 90s. Uh, the humidity is 100%. Uh, and then we frequently get battered by high wind type storms like tropical storms and so on and so forth. So really the idea of growing vegetables in a normal time when most of the rest of the country is growing vegetables is not advisable. So in Florida we tend to focus on at least central Florida south focus on growing vegetables during the fall and spring. And I would say especially in the fall. But as we grow even in the fall I like to think of, well, how resilient are these plants going to be against the occasional windstorm, like it's been pretty windy right now, uh, occasionally drying out, those kinds of things. But I want something that's going to be fairly pest resistant as well because there are a lot of bugs around here, a lot. Uh, so I found two that I think fit all those categories and more. They're also in the category of super foods, so to speak. So I'm looking at a Healthline article right now, Nine Impressive Health Benefits of Beets. And they claim they're packed with essential vitamins and minerals, plants, compounds, and lots of which have medicinal properties. Now, I'm not making these claims, but here's what Healthline says. A lot of nutrients and not many calories. Uh, they say if you have 100 grams of the stuff, cooked beetroot, you get 44 calories and you get a, about 2 grams of protein and all kinds of minerals. Things like vitamin B6, folate, vitamin C, potassium, phosphorus, manganese, minerals. I think beets taste particularly earthy, which I love the flavor of beets so much. It's such an unusual thing, which I can't wait to see if I have success growing them. 
They claim to keep your your blood pressure in check. If that's the case, I'm going to eat beets all the time. Uh, can improve athletic performance. Nice. Fights inflammation. Does this solve every health problem? May improve digestive health. May help support brain health. May have anti-cancer properties. May help you lose weight. Delicious and easy to include in your diet. They say. Well, if it does all those things, even if it did one of those things, it would be worth growing. I, I don't know if anybody can substantiate these claims, but I sure like the idea. Hey, James Tropicals. Welcome. Tried to grow cauliflower, but it got really hot and it went bad. Yeah, I, I haven't had uh, any experience growing cauliflower, to be quite honest. I grew a little broccoli. The, uh, what they call Italian broccoli, which is a more leafy, kind of stemmy version of broccoli. Yeah, so the benefits of beets are far and wide. And the type of beet that I've got is this type. I bought it from, uh, actually they gave me a gift certificate. I got this from uh, Seeds Now. By the way, link's in the description if you want to get some of your own. But there are a lot of seeds. And... Uh, they claim that it's a 90% germination success type of seed. And the seeds are unusual. I'm going to plant these here in a moment, but first I want to go over I want to go over the red kale, which is another notorious um, highly touted healthy green, right? This is the red type which makes it novel. Turnips in the winter in Tampa growing up, so George very successful. I'm glad to hear that about the turnips. I, I will say that I also, I'm going to bring up this Burpees article, I also read on the Burpees web, Burpee website, they claim that uh, this is a great choice for container growing. It's easy early spring and again in the fall type of crop in containers. They also say that growing beets um, with early sweetness and rich colors, beets are delicious addition to your garden. Yeah. So they just tout them as being pretty easy to grow and with that 90 percent germination estimation on them it's good and then we've got some data from george that says yeah they grow in tampa just fine which is about the same area of florida that i'm in just on the eastern side of the state um and by the way go bucks i'm actually drinking a witch's brew that is delicious combination of unsweetened soy milk <laughs> for the protein and I like it. it's kind of nutty with Dunkin Donuts unsweetened coffee but there's plenty of sweetness in the soy milk okay here we go let's look at what kale has to offer according to healthline.com they say kale is among the most nutrient dense foods on the planet and of course it's popular I mean kale kale everything if you know anything about kale you know it forms a cult like appreciation and probably because it's so just full of vitamins they say that a cup of raw kale a single cup if you could just even if it was super bitter if you could just choke down a cup of kale you're going to get 206 percent of your vitamin a 684 percent of your vitamin k 134 percent of your vitamin c b6 a little bit a little bit of manganese some manganese calcium copper potassium magne magnesium yeah so these are cool minerals micronutrients that you probably might not be exposed to in your normal diet if you're me which i would like to be so kale is loaded with powerful antioxidants like quercetin and camphorol and they say that these things uh, are very good for you heart protective blood pressure lowering anti-inflammatory so again antiviral antidepressant anti-cancer wow okay I like it <laughs> uh, vitamin C excellent source of vitamin C Kale can help lower cholesterol, they claim. It's one of the world's best sources of vitamin K. Again, they, they 
tout the cancer-fighting properties, the high in beta-carotene, which we've heard about in carrots, but good for you, certainly. I believe that's a good source of minerals. Yeah, that's what we were just talking about in people that don't get enough minerals. It's high in lutein and zooxanthin, powerful nutrients that protect your eyes. Mm. I, I thought that beta-carotene was one of those two, and kale should be able to help you lose weight. <laughs> I'm sure if you ate nothing but kale, you would lose weight rapidly because it has almost no calories. Just that alone. The worst tasting vegetable, says George. Yeah, I know. That's why I say like if you just choke it down, it's like grow a cup of kale and just treat it like medicine. Or I think a lot of people mask the incredible bitterness of it in um, in smoothies. Right, if you could just put it in with like a, a couple of apples and an orange, it's like the kale is almost a aftertaste. <laughs> but uh, I like bitter vegetables, though personally, I, I to a point. Right, there's a there's a, a limit. But the what these are the kale and so this is the just red kale. And these are touted as microgreens, which I thought was kind of an interesting concept, really. I haven't researched microgreens as an idea, but uh, it's, you know, they send you about a billion seeds, and I think that just means you plant a lot of them densely, and then you eat the, the greens that grow. So I plan to, th this planting that I'm going to do here, I plan on planting a lot of them thickly. Okay, so for this portion of the podcast, I'm also going to extend the... Uh, the view of my camera just a bit. Yeah, I can easily make my display just a little larger and then you'll be able to see the the setup I've got. I've got some pots right over here that I'll be using. And I agree with you, George. The worst tasting vegetables are the best for you. A powerful incentive for me was always Popeye the Sailor Man choked down his spinach it seemed like but he would get a can of that anywhere he could for its superhuman properties and if you're like me you're hearing that sound that Popeye makes right now okay so this is a great I hope my canopy doesn't flip over this is a great way to grow anything I think just because it's so simple so spartan so compact so utilitarian and so pragmatic it's just a regular old soft pot you get 50 of them for like eight bucks on off of Amazon I got links in the description and then you just plop in some miracle growth uh, potting soil which is pretty rich and then I do a special extra step which I would suggest you do as well which is to get some regular cow manure even if it's composted cow manure which is what I use uh, just breaks it up a little bit makes it easier, easier to work with you add in a little of that, uh, maybe about a cup in a pot this size. This is a six inch pot, the diameter of the pot. You can see it's got nice rich soil in there, which I would like to not get in the laptop, but only time will tell. Okay, I'm gonna just dip the, dip the display down just a bit. Okay, let's get started with these uh, these little red kale microgreens, and I'm going to put them in pretty densely. I, you know, just winging it really. Uh, I, I think I'll just sprinkle them along the top, and then just lightly bury them under the surface as a way of of doing this. And I'm putting quite a few in here on purpose because I want to have them grow in densely, and then harvest the the greens. Okay, I don't know how many I just put in, but you know, I, I didn't use a lot, but I probably put in a good 50 or so. And I'm just going to now, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to take, rather than even disturb it, I'm just going to, because I like the way that they're distributed in there, I'm just going to take a little bit of this soil and just sprinkle it on top. I don't even want to really move it. And when I, when I put the soil in, when I put the water in to water it, I'm going to just lightly sprinkle that on there when I put it over on the grow table. Just let it drip on there ever so slowly. I always think like that's the time to take your to take your time. 
All right, now how will I remember that that is a micro kale? Well, I'm going to take the stem of one of these. Oh, it smells so good. Yeah, I just took this off of a basil flower that I've got over here, if you can see that basil flower. We're gonna grow that in the next live stream, but ah, maybe we'll grow it in this. Let's grow it in this one. Why, why wait? Okay, so we'll grow some basil too. Okay, so this is how I know. <laughs> Very sophisticated system. This is how I know that I've got that uh, delicious red kale in there. Okay, next one. I got a question. George, do you have iguanas here? Whoa, there goes the coffee. I think we're, yeah, we're okay. We survived the coffee spill just fine. <laughs> it's a good thing that I brought that, brought a napkin with me, a little paper towel. It's able to wipe that up, no problem. All right, so no, we don't have iguanas around here, surprisingly. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that conclusively. I'm saying I typically don't see iguanas, but we have a lot of lizards, small lizards. The, the Cuban anole, A-N-O-L-E, is a very common lizard that's kind of moved into this uh, area, but there's a Florida type of green lizard that's very common around here. We've got a lot of reptilian life. Um, black racer is very common with a number of different types of snakes. Okay, so here we are with the the dark green beets. I'm going to do the same kind of thing with the exception of I have no remaining coffee to knock over. Yeah, I'm just not sure if I'm planting too many of these. I really am not. If you, if you have micro green growing experience, micro green growing, please let me know in the comments. Uh, now or after you watch this in the future if you find out if we're doing this right <laughs> there you go you can see i've just dispersed them around and uh something like 30 or so of those planted this one i've got a little extra soil right here i'm just going to sprinkle on top again all this soil has been slightly supplemented with that cow manure i just recommend you do that and I have another little idea, and that is that if it's good soil, you should be able to take it up to your nose like that and just smell it. It should smell good. You know, even the cow manure and composted cow manure, I mean, it smells earthy, it smells good, it smells like it's going to produce. Okay, so now we have that one, and I have to come up with some cryptic marking system for this one as well. I'm going to use a similar system, but this one's just going to have more branches. And I'll, I'll come up with, I'll just take a Sharpie and label the side of the pot. That's another nice thing about working with these pots is as you grow 50 things, which is what I did here, 50 pot challenge. I've got a What You Got Growing On series that I've been running on the channel for a couple of months now, and I'm going to continue it for a long time, which is growing things in that grow table. And uh, I bought these pots in order to do it, and they've been working out quite well. Okay, so we got that. And I did say I would plant the basil. So I'm going to do that. Just this basil that I've got in my, from my yard that I've been growing. This is regular Italian basil. This is the seed pod that grows on the top. And most of you will probably know a thing or two about basil. But you should know most importantly that it is a prolific grower. It will grow from a seed incredibly easy. Now, in the next live stream I'm going to do this afternoon, I'm going to grow a couple varieties of exotic basil that I got from a friend of mine, Ben and his wife. We'll be uh, making some appearances on this show, I'm, a, uh, I'm assured. But the process of taking this basil and planting it is very easy. And that is I just take it with my hand, pinch the base, and pull it away. And you can see we've got some falling down here with it. What you do is you, you get a, a big, oh, don't want it to blow away because these will blow away. You get little papery seed pod things. And again, I'm just going to 
do the same thing as the microgreens. Maybe I'll try microgreens. I'll make my own microgreens. Basil microgreens. It's a new thing. Just plant a hundred of them in a small pot. <laughs> Call microgreens. All right. Yeah, so that one did pretty well. And I think to honor this flower sacrifice, we'll just go ahead and stick this one right in there. So I'll know that is the... Uh, how do we prevent bugs and animals from eating the edibles and vegetables? Yeah, uh, one thing is to plant things that they don't want to eat. <laughs> I think that would be my quick answer, is plant vegetables. And, because, yeah, you, you know, the name of this podcast is Welcome to the Fruit Jungle. It's a jungle in a number of ways. It's a jungle in a way that things grow quickly, but it's also a jungle in terms of lots of birds, lots of insects, lots of diseases and things that can get around. So... You know, how do I avoid a lot of that? One way is to use a natural spray, which I will share with you, that consists of three ingredients, which you can spray on your plants, which is not toxic, and uh, it's easy to make. So you get garlic or onion, and you macerate that. You just mash it up to, so the juice is all in, a, in something, in a bowl. right? You add to that dish soap, and uh, then to that you add water. That concoction you mix up, strain it out so that you get out all the plant matter, and it'll smell like super garlicky, oniony dishwater, and spray that on everything. That will keep almost everything away. That's an old trick that my Aunt Mary taught me that I use that, that I use if I need to. But the bigger thing that I do uh, is to plant things that are really more likely to survive around here and be resilient to the types of pests and, and things that I encounter. So another component to that is when we encounter problems with trees and so on, like I'll give you an example, my brown turkey fig tree that's over over there, a lot of videos about it, uh, it gets a type of copper, type of, uh, not copper, a type of uh, blight or something on the leaves, a rust on the leaves they call it, and those leaves get crumpled and burned ends and fall off but it doesn't affect the fruiting the tree's been growing for years so i don't i don't worry about it but i also don't treat it because you have to put this copper fungicide all over it and it creates this whole nightmare of chemicals and stuff so you know the brown turkey fig in my yard works there there are a lot of varieties of these fruit trees and vegetables to choose from like you know we're growing micro beets here in this podcast and the red kind, but there were like 15 other types on seed now, seedsnow.com. So, um, you know, it's a matter of finding, dialing it in. And it's not, I think this was like two, $2 or a dollar. I mean, it was like really inexpensive. So by the way, there's a link in the uh, affiliates link in the description. If you click on that, you help the channel, but, uh, yeah, that's a good place to get a lot of these seeds. I've got many other seeds that I got from them that I'm gonna that I have in a mylar bag that I'll be growing in, in future podcasts. But I want to start with these two and track them very carefully. The most important thing is going to be now that especially they don't have anything like a cutting sticking out to identify them that I remember what was in each and write them down with a with a uh, sharpie. You have a turkey fig, but the squirrels and birds pick them clean. Wow. That's a bummer. I can tell you that mine produces so many, so many fruit that I don't, the birds and the squirrels and everything are constantly attacking it, but it produces so many uh, brown turkey figs that it it's still plenty for me. But a lot, of, I'd say about 20% to 30% of the figs I'll find already have a, you know, the bird has eaten it or a squirrel has come up and eaten it. But I, there's so many that I still get plenty for myself. And the other thing I found is if I pick them before they get fully ripe, you know, that's the other thing. But I've had, cher I had cherry trees where as a kid, my grandfather had cherry trees that would grow and just be picked clean the moment, the day that they were ripe by the birds, which is to me one of the keys of dealing with that scenario is to pick them prior to them being ripe. You know, and the figs certainly, like the brown turkey figs, you pick those they'll ripen up in less than a day, but they can go from being, you know, kind of, you know, unripe to ripe rapidly once you pick them. And they turn purple then, too. You know, I, I found when I let them turn purple on the tree, the brown turkey fig can uh, tend to get an opening on the end, which allows the bugs up into them, and that's, you know, the end of the, the, end of the show. 
so to speak. Hey, Big Cat, is date and a fig the same thing? No, definitely not. A date comes from a date palm, which is a gigantic thing, looks something like a phoenix palm, like a gigantic robolini, massive. Uh, I've been in date orchards in Costa Rica, and they just go on and on and on, and the trees are just huge, tall. So, yeah, the, the date tree, date palm, produces the dates, but then they, you know, there are many varieties of fig trees and many varieties of date palms as well. But typically the one that, uh, that I've seen grown agriculturally is just gigantic. And the palm fruit harvest flowers are incredible. Huge. Yeah, we almost, we got lost one time on a surf trip in a Costa Rican date palm forest and uh, I didn't know if we were going to make it out I mean we're just going for miles and miles and miles and it's nothing but these gigantic perfectly spaced rows of date palms as far as you can look and uh, we made it out though like you couldn't see which way the sun was setting if you got turned around at least you can navigate by the sun wow you grow pawpaw fruit George nice yeah, sacrifice about 50% to the raccoons, possums, and squirrels. Yeah, we're outclassed, even if it's in terms of just sheer numbers by these vermin. My father had a uh, lake house years ago, and, um, well, he decided to start feeding the raccoons. That's a widely tried experiment. There's actually a guy on YouTube, the raccoon whisperer, <laughs> who's incredibly popular that feeds them hot dogs and I saw a recent video he had seemed like a hundred raccoons on his back patio yeah. I see raccoons here I've seen a raccoon climbing up this up this mango tree you know they're they're uh, hanging down by their two back feet like the most athletic creature you can ever imagine and then with the other with the other two hands hanging upside down, grabbing the branch and picking at the mango. No. You're not going to compete with that. <laughs> they're getting all the mangoes they want. Thankfully, they don't want them until they're ripe. And that's another good example of, of what I'm talking about is that you can pick them before they are ripe. Coyotes, we actually, I live on a barrier island here in the eastern side of Florida, and we actually did have a coyote situation here that was like the talk of the town. There were a couple of coyotes that were roaming around and eating people's pets. <laughs> Not that people having their pets eaten is funny, but they did get rid of the coyotes. They trapped them and removed them. It's easy to do that here on a barrier island. When my son was very young, uh, he had this concern about bears, and uh, we didn't know where that came from because, uh, you know, I always tell him there's no bears here. And one time he told me, uh, you know, it's all houses. There's no place for a bear to live. And he said, well, um, yeah, but at school they're always telling me that I live on a barrier island. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the coyotes are just unstoppable, I believe. I was told once that when they are hunted and their numbers start to get depleted, that the coyotes will make a sound that triggers other coyotes, and it actually triggers the female coyotes to produce, produce much larger litters and then disperse. So, ironically, efforts to reduce the numbers of a coyote could actually, paradoxically, increase their numbers dramatically. So, they are a miniature wolf. A coyote is a type of wolf. One time I was uh, walking on a golf course in Southern California in the evening, back from a surf surfing session, and... Um, I looked to my left and realized there were about something like 10 to 15 coyotes that were running. I was kind of jogging along and they were kind of jogging along parallel to me in the dark. And that was a pretty, 
pretty freaky moment because I had heard them down in the canyons and so on. But now they just kept on going. They just kept on going right by me. But there were a lot of them, and they were running with me in the dark, and I had never even seen them. There were a bunch of them. But if they wanted to overpower me, they were, I was done. But they didn't, obviously. Wow, you have them all the way up in Arlington, Virginia, coyotes. Big ones, too. Yeah, yeah, I bet you they are. You know, especially in residential areas. That's the thing about residential areas is that they can harbor all the things that would normally just be wide open. Like, you know, in residential areas, deer, for for instance, become, you know, very overpopulated easily because none of the natural predators and even the hunters can't get into the neighborhoods to, to reduce their numbers and they are feeding on people's vegetable gardens or whatever and they just, yeah, it creates this weird dynamic. But I know certainly in areas of the country that's a thing. Wow, that's cool, big cat. Up in Canada, they thrive in the winter. <laughs> yeah, they're like micro wolves. Oh, how many hurricanes have I been through? Good question. I have been through one hurricane here where the eye has come directly over me, where I could look up and I could see the curve of the eye and it came right over. That was Hurricane Aaron back in the 90s, and that was about a 95 mile an hour sustained wind storm. The others we have, we'd evacuated from when it got over 100 mile an hour winds, but we probably had about six other events where the wind touched 100 miles an hour or over for some amount of time and gusts or whatever, but sustained winds more in the 90s, you know. We've had, the, back in the, well, about, I guess about 10 years ago, we had those three storms that came right over us and um, that was, everybody in Florida suffered on that one just in terms of, we had two young kids and no power for three weeks. <laughs> It's cool to come to terms with the idea of, like, there's nowhere to buy bread within 100 miles of here for two weeks or something. You know, like those kind of moments. Which is nothing compared to what they have to deal with in some parts of the world. So I'm not complaining. I'm just saying, yeah, the hurricanes are interesting. The hurricanes have shaped this yard over and over and over again, knocked them down, knocked down trees, forced me to regrow, redo things, whatever, but overall real positive force. Oh wow, snowmobiling. Yeah, if they hear the howls, they get on and start riding again. That's a good idea. I think I would do the same thing. Uh, in terms of flooding, here uh, my house is according to GPS coordinates 10 feet above sea level 10 I don't know if that's true I, that's what the machine said but um, yeah that's not very high so we've got san sandy sea dunes here that are about 25 feet above sea level so they'd have to overtop that we haven't seen anything that's been taller than that so we've been fairly fairly dry here I haven't had to deal with any flooding from the ocean I know like in Cape Hatteras and places like that you know they build up all the houses on stilts because uh, that's so frequent the coastal flooding here the storm surge has been we've been very lucky you know that can change in one year and then you have new inlets wow that is so cool, Big Cat. They'll stalk the sleds for 20 kilometers. That is incredible. Yeah, they're like little pack dogs, like huskies or whatever, like wolves. Yeah, they could just go and go and go. So resilient. Uh, George asks about the how did the garden withstand the hurricanes. Uh, it knocked over a grapefruit tree of mine five times, you know, over the years and things like that. But it really... Uh, just forces you to find plants that are wind res resilient and uh, they need to be wind, wind resilient here not just for the hurricanes but also for um, just the regular wind events I mean just like normal fall event <laughs> just a papaya just came down they're, they're like I call them little soft coconuts you know they come just right down but they don't hurt as much as a coconut when they fall but anyway yeah, so the wind has helped 
to shape the yard, but you end up finding varieties of plants that just end up doing well in the windy conditions. Yeah, the Bismarck palm. I'm glad you brought up the Bismarck palm, George, because um, and palm defoliation during storms and windy events. I have not had a problem at all with palm, palm defoliation in windy storms. Uh, most of the things we've got around here in, are already super resilient to windiness. Other, you know, things like a triangle palm and maybe some things like arecas will get punched by them, but they grow back so fast, you know, and especially if you're using things like just sprinkling around that cow manure around the palm trees. Just a, I always tell people, if you want to do one thing to your palm trees or your plants, you know, sprinkle around some natural organic slow release type of nutrients. But yeah, the Bismarck is just such a champ. And uh, Bismarck, big fan, gray fan palm. I've considered getting them here in my yard uh, many times. They're just so big. But they have that real flat, a real flat frond that goes out, you know, I don't know, it's a meter wide, you know, the, the Bismarck palm frond. But there's another type of palm tree which is a little smaller that looks a lot like that. Some people call it the Puerto Rican hat palm, I believe, and I don't know the name off the top of my head, but it's very similar, just a little smaller, and it has a kind of a curl on the end of that that fan, more like a Chinese fan palm. But very interesting. Uh, it is the Bismarck wind resistant? I'll say it'll break a frond or two, but yes, it is quite wind resistant. Um, and again, the re the real wind resistance of the palm is in its ability to quickly regrow what has been lost, in my estimation. And um, the other thing is that it's the really the fact that its wind resistance is that its wind resistance is contained in the trunk of the palm tree. So even if the top gets just frayed and fried off by the wind, that it, as long as it's standing up straight, typically it'll regrow back in. You know, so you see palm trees that have been pulled out, or if you ever pulled out and stumped a palm tree. The, the roots are in every single direction. It's just a complete, in all directions, the roots come out from that, that center point, and that's what just anchors it so firmly in the windy conditions, makes it a perfect choice. One popular thing to do here is to propagate coconut trees everywhere, uh, Johnny Coconut Seed. Got a lot of Johnny Coconut Seeds out there. They're taking their green coconuts that are just dropping copiously at the base of their coconut trees and they're dropping them up in the dunes or up in you know around here there and everywhere you just bury that coconut about two inches deep where the rest of it's sticking up above the ground and a lot of times it'll send down a taproot and up comes a coconut so it's really just about that easy to some extent you know but if you if you pile ten of them in a place in the side of a th park or wherever and then and you know two of them grow well now you've got coconuts Johnny Pawpaw Seed <laughs> of Arlington. Yeah, exactly. That's right. You know, what's that old story of the Johnny Appleseed thing? It really is just like this concept that we've gotten away from, perhaps, some some of us, which is that, uh, you know, where does the food come from? Straight out of the ground, yo. So, you know, maybe we should have more Johnny Pawpaw Seeds, Jan Johnny Banana Seeds. Yeah, and start to get to know things that are edible that are just common and grow well. Oh, it's it's raining. That's good. I've been planning a lot of things. I'm actually putting together a lot of videos to release soon on the channel. Um, probably have content about every other day. If it starts to rain too much, I'll have to retreat in. But we'll see how it goes. Yeah, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Look at this. So far, so good, but it is starting to pick up. So yeah, we got some red things planted. We got some basil planted, just regular Italian basil, and uh, we'll see how they grow. And as a matter of fact, I won't even really have to water it. I'll probably just put it over on the grow table and let it do its thing all natural. How many palm species am I growing? I am growing I'm going to come up with an accurate count. Three, four. Four varieties. And 
five if you count the sable palm I've got growing over in the What You Got Growing On series. So I've got the sable palm growing as seeds over on the grow table. I've got some queen palms around here, which I use that look a lot like coconuts, but are easier to manage. I've got some robolini, which are like dwarf date palms. And then I've got the areca palm, which is a great, they call that the sugarcane palm. That's a great clumping palm, kind of ornate. Oh, good, it stopped raining. Yeah, so lots of different types of palms, and then lots of palms in the area that I'm interested in exploring and checking out. The thing is with the palms, I've got to be careful, you know, because they take up so much space. They really do. And uh, I don't want to trade too much space with non-edible things. Um, one of the things I want to do is to plant a pindo palm. Oops. Well, luckily the rain doesn't seem to be reaching this laptop. Yeah, excellent. Norma, how you doing? Yeah, the rain is great timing for the seeds you planted on Monday, already growing. Yeah, we love it. Fall showers. The Christmas palm. I don't have much experience with the Christmas palm, to be honest. Although I, I've seen some clumping palms here around the neighborhood that I need to research that form a bright red and green seed pattern about this time of year. And I always thought, wow, they, wow, they should name that the Christmas palm. It's like the... the um, what is it? The poinsettia of palm trees. Doubt it's the same thing you're talking about. Yeah, so. Thanks, Norma. Okay, and then I'll just mention one more thing before I jump off. I might do another podcast here later, but it is getting awfully uh, wet in these parts. And that is that I've issued a viewer challenge, activity, fun thing to do, which is... Go ahead and shoot a 30 second long video of the things that you're growing. Even if it's winter and snow, it's even cooler that way actually for me um, because it's novel for where I live. Um, and show what kinds of edible things you've got in your area, whether it's outside frozen right now or inside your house is you're weathering the winter conditions, getting ready for the spring where we all spring forth into growing all good things. So let me know. Uh, what you're growing by sending that video, 30 second video, shot in landscape mode, not portrait if you do it on your phone, landscape mode to my email address, which is listed in the about area of the channel. You see a uh, you know, prickly pears, yes, would be a great choice, by the way, prickly pears for making a shot. I've got a type of prickly pear here that's an edible, uh, thornless type, so really cool. Okay, so hopefully you'll participate in that. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Use the links in the description if you'd like to support the channel. If you're going to Amazon anyway, you can use the links in any of my videos, and that helps me to keep up with the camera equipment and such. It doesn't cost you anything extra. So thanks for watching. Eat Your Backyard. I appreciate you a lot. Have a great day. Uh, look for these live streams. Turn on notification bell. That way you'll know as they happen. Thanks for watching.